Now with the fifth invocation in New Made Devotions. Amen, amen, I say to you, if you ask the Father anything in my name, he will give it to you. But where is it written that he must at once accede to our petitions? Have we not examples even in the gospel, proving that our divine Savior permitted himself to be importuned long before he granted the request? Remember the woman of Canaan? She cried out to Jesus, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David, my daughter is grievously troubled by a devil. But he answered her not a word. And when she would not cease her importunities, his disciples came and besought him, Send her away, grant her prayer, for she crieth after us. But neither do they receive a propitious answer, for he declares that he was sent only for the Jews, not for pagans. Then the woman fell down at the feet of Jesus and implored him with fervor such as only an afflicted mother's heart could feel. But even her pathetic cry, Lord, help me, seems to fail in the desired effect, for there is little hope in his stern reply. It is not good to take the bread out of the children and cast it to the dogs. Might not the poor Canaanite have said within herself, Oh, cruel and hard of heart, he will not hear me. But no, such a thought does not arise in her mind. On the contrary, she understands how to deduce from those very words the reason why he should grant her request. Yea, Lord, for the whelps also eat of the crumbs that fall from the table of their masters. It is now that he grants her request, saying, O woman, great is thy faith, be it done to thee as thou wilt. If the poor supplicant had lost courage and confidence, and ceased to pray, she would have obtained nothing. It was her persevering prayer alone that obtained for her the desired aid. We must, therefore, persevere in prayer, and leave it to Christ to hear us or not, as he sees expedient for us. Remember this, my dear Christian, and when your prayers are not heard, suppress the impatient murmur. It is of no use to pray. Continue to pray. What Christ does not bestow on you today, he may give you tomorrow. And what you cannot now obtain of him, you may receive later. As you do not know what is profitable for you, so neither do you know the time in which it is expedient for you to obtain your request. God knows it. Hence he delays granting your petition till he sees that it is good for you. Therefore, persevere in prayer, and if praying is of no avail, seek. If you do not succeed with seeking, begin to knock, and the master, though he should be fast asleep, will arise on account of your importunity and give you the desired loaves of bread. That Christ may be sure to hear us, we must have recourse to his mother, and present our petitions through her hands. Mary, says St. Alphonsus, is a kind intercessor. She herself presents the prayers of her servants to God, above all those prayers which are directly addressed to her. As the Son intercedes with the Heavenly Father for us, so she intercedes with the Son. Nay, she's incessantly occupied with both Father and Son, laboring for our salvation and obtaining for us the graces of which we stand in need. St. Dennis, therefore, calls Mary a particular, a special refuge of the erring, a hope of the miserable, an intercessor for all who have recourse to her. We see this verified in an event in the life of St. Philip Neri. This saint had in his congregation a disciple whom he loved most tenderly, Caesar Baronius, who subsequently became cardinal and distinguished himself no less by his piety than by his learning. One day he fell sick, and notwithstanding that everything was done for his relief, he continued to grow worse until finally his condition became critical in the extreme. St. Philip addressed himself to Christ and fervently prayed for the recovery of his beloved disciple. He prayed, Spare Caesar to me, I demand his health, O Christ, 
but he could not obtain the favor for which he so ardently longed. He then had recourse to Mary, and asked her to obtain from her son the health of his beloved disciple, and behold, his request was granted. Caesar Baronius recovered his health. My dear Christian, whenever you present a petition to your divine Savior, do not fail to commend it to his mother also, and ask her to plead your cause before him with her all-powerful intercession. Do this especially when your repeated and protracted petitions to God for a certain grace fail to obtain the desired response. Mary surely will obtain for you what you ask, provided it is good and salutary for you and consistent with the will of her beloved Son. Sixth Invocation God the Father of Heaven, have mercy on us. When we say, God the Father, we acknowledge that the Father, the first person of the Blessed Trinity, is true God, and consequently that he possesses all the perfections which we believe to be contained in the Godhead. We call him Father, not only because he has created us, but also, and especially, because through Jesus Christ we have become his children. Hence the Apostle writes, when the fullness of the time was come, God sent his Son, made of a woman, made under the law, that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. Oh, what happiness for us to be allowed to call God our Father, and to know that we are not only called, but are in reality children of God. How sublime is our dignity! The child of the poorest beggar, can truly say, God, the Lord of heaven and earth, is my Father, and I am his child. Should we not respect this inexpressible dignity in the poorest and most insignificant human being? Should we not, remembering our exalted dignity, reject with contempt all low and animal lusts, and say, I am of too noble an origin to degrade myself with such base and ignoble things? And what perfect confidence should we not repose in a God who is our Father, and in a Father who is our God? This Father is God, therefore omnipotent. There is nothing that can be conceived with which he cannot place at our disposal at once. This God is our Father, therefore he is all love and goodness towards us, and ever ready to bestow upon us what is truly good and salutary for us. My dear Christian, rejoice that you are a child of God, and do not disgrace your noble lineage by the gratification of low passions. It would move you to pity to see a child of royal blood become a swineherd. Far more unbecoming would it be for you to indulge the lust of the flesh. Let not your courage fail in any situation of life. When all other help fails, there is one from whom you can obtain relief your Father in heaven. If the weight of sins overburden your conscience, do not despond. He will not reject you if you return to him with a contrite and humble heart. God the Father is omnipresent. No place in the wide universe can be imagined where he is not. In him we live and move and have our being. Nevertheless, we say, God the Father of heaven because heaven is the place where God principally manifests his power and glory. There the blessed behold him face to face, in the splendor of his infinite majesty, and transported with delight exclaim with St. Peter, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Again we say, God, the Father of heaven, to indicate that heaven is our destination, our true home. The earth is only a temporary abode, in which we do not long remain. We are strangers and pilgrims here below, and soon we shall arrive at the end of our journey. Therefore the Apostle says, We have no lasting city here, but we seek one to come. This city is heaven, where we shall dwell for all eternity. I appoint you as my Father hath appointed me, a kingdom that you may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom. Oh, how glorious is our destiny! 
Who would not exclaim with St. Ignatius, Oh, how I disdain the world when I contemplate heaven! Finally, the words God, the Father of heaven, give us to understand that we must elevate our hearts to God as often as we pray. Can we imagine a greater act of impoliteness than that of a man who would, while speaking to a respectable man, turn his back upon him with deliberate disrespect? It would be still more unbecoming in us if, while conversing with God in prayer, we should turn our eyes and hearts away from him and give ourselves up to distractions. God could justly upbraid us in these words, These people with their lips glorify me, but their heart is far from me. Do not forget, my dear Christian, that the Savior has prepared a mansion for you in heaven. Do not attach your heart to the world, its pleasures and goods. Ah, be not so foolish as to forfeit heaven with its unspeakable everlasting delights for fleeting pleasures and transitory joys. If a traveler, journeying homeward, should stop and spend all his means in building a palace in the land that was not his own, and neglect to provide for a dwelling for himself in that country where he was to reside during his whole life, he would be considered insane. And must not the same be said of you, who only think of gratifying yourself in this world, which is your abode but for a few days, and heed not the danger of being miserable in the next, where you will live forever? as long as God shall be God? Often consider these earnest words of Christ. What doth it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Settle the affairs of your conscience, if necessary, make a general confession, pray with attention, and henceforth live in such a manner that you can confidently hope at the hour of death to be received into the mansions of never-ending bliss. We have more than one reason to cry to God, our Father in heaven, for mercy. We are wretched children of Eve, who wander through a valley of tears, unable to help ourselves, whilst our spiritual enemies attack us on every side, and are indefatigable in their exertions to lead us into sin and everlasting ruin. We are, moreover, wicked children of our heavenly Father, for we have often grievously offended him in thought, word, and deed, and returned not but in gratitude for all his love. We have reason to say with the prodigal son, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. It will therefore be to our advantage to have recourse to Mary, the mother of mercy, and to implore her intercession with God the Father. He will not despise her prayer for she is his beloved daughter, and at the same time the mother of his son. That Mary's intercession in our behalf is indeed most efficacious, we learn from the following example. Father Engelgrave relates that a certain religious was so tormented by scruples that sometimes he was almost driven to despair. But having great devotion to Mary, the mother of sorrows, he had recourse to her in the agony of his spirit, and was much consoled by the contemplation of her exceeding grief. Death came, and the devil renewed his efforts to torment him with scruples and thoughts of despair. But behold, our merciful mother, seeing her son so afflicted, deigned to grant him the consolation of her presence, and said to him with ineffable sweetness, O oh, why? O oh, my son, art thou so overcome with sorrow? Thou who hast so often consoled me by thy compassion for my sorrows. Be comforted, she continued. Jesus sends me to thee to console thee. Rejoice, and come with me to paradise. At these words, this fervent client of Mary tranquilly expired, full of the most perfect confidence and the brightest hope which was changed to glad fruition in the kingdom of glory and joy. My dear Christian, this incident illustrates in a most striking manner the exceeding great kindness of our Blessed Mother and the munificence with which she rewards those who are faithful to her during life. If, from any cause whatsoever, 
you dread to appear before God, and tremble lest he prove to you a stern judge. Have recourse to Mary, his dear mother and ours, and she will obtain for you relief. If it be on account of your sins, seek refuge with her, and she will beg her divine Son to have mercy. If the devil torment you, and try to drive you to despair by suggesting scruples and coloring some venial fault in the lurid light of hell, go to your protectress, and she, who has never been known to abandon those who sought her aid, will assuredly afford you relief. Seventh Invocation God the Son, Redeemer of the World, have mercy on us. The Son, to whom we cry for mercy, is Jesus Christ, the second person of the Most Holy Trinity, of the same essence with the Father, therefore true God. That Jesus Christ is true God with the Father, he has not only frequently and most solemnly declared, but has also incontrovertibly proved by numerous miracles, especially by his resurrection and ascension. He himself appealed to these miracles as a proof of his divinity, for he said to the Jews, If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But if I do, though you will not believe me, believe the works, that you may know and believe that the Father is in me, and I in the Father. The countless miracles which the apostles and the Christians of all times have performed in the name of Jesus are so many proofs of his divinity, for the power to work miracles, as no one dreams of disputing, belongs to God alone. Now if Christ has worked miracles through himself and through his adherents, he manifestly is God. Christ is God equal to the Father, but is distinct from him in person. The Father is of himself from all eternity. The Son is begotten by the Father from all eternity, therefore he is eternal as the Father. Christ is not only God, but also man. He is God and man at one at the same time, whence he is often called the God-man. His human nature, like that of every other human being, consists of a body and soul. He was not always man, but only from the time when he came down from heaven for our redemption. We celebrate the great, the ineffable mystery of the incarnation of the Son of God annually on the festival of the Annunciation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, March 25th, and thrice commemorated daily in the Angelus Domini. When Jesus Christ, the Son of God, became man, he did not cease to be God. He only united our human nature with his divinity. This union is inseparable, indissoluble. That is, Christ, having once assumed human nature, never divested himself of it, and never will divest himself of it for all eternity. When he died on the cross, his soul only was separated from his body, but his Godhead remained united with his soul as well as with his body. As God and man, Jesus Christ sits at the right hand of God. As God and man, he is present in the sacrament of the altar, and is received by us in holy communion, as nourishment for our soul. In regard to his divinity, Christ is omnipresent, but his humanity dwells only in heaven, and in the holy sacrament of the altar. Nor can it be said that as his divinity is everywhere, so is his humanity, for that does not follow. This truth can be clearly illustrated by the following example. We all know that the head is intimately connected with the soul, yet no one would think of saying that a man's head is in every place that his soul is. My dear Christian, in order to be saved, you must firmly believe this chief and fundamental truth of our holy religion. For he who does not believe that Jesus Christ is true God and that he became man for us is no Christian, consequently cannot be saved. The apostle writes that in the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and those that are in heaven, on earth, and in hell. 
manifest the great veneration for your divine Savior in every place, but especially in church, where he is truly present in the holy sacrament. Kneel reverently, turn your eyes towards the altar, fold your hands devoutly, and adore him with a heart animated with a lively faith and an ardent love. Beware of taking the most holy name of Jesus in vain, or of profaning it by curses, imprecations, and blasphemies. Jesus Christ, the Son of God made man, is the Redeemer of the world. He has redeemed all men from the curse of sin, from the slavery of the devil, and from eternal damnation. He has reconciled us with God, opened for us a pathway into heaven, which had been closed against us by sin, and merited for us abundant graces, by cooperating with which we can lead a life of holiness and work out our salvation. How has he accomplished this wonderful work of our redemption? By his death on the cross. He died for us, he shed his precious blood, in order to efface the stains of sin from our souls, and to recover for us the favor and grace of his heavenly Father. Knowing that you were not redeemed with corruptible gold and silver, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb unspotted and undefiled. That he might be able to redeem us, it was necessary for Christ to be both God and man. If he had not been God, he could not have rendered full and perfect satisfaction for our sins, which, as offenses against God, contain an infinite guilt. For man, as a created being, can accomplish only finite things. If he had not been man, he could not have fulfilled the condition upon which the redemption of sinful man was alone possible, according to the decree of God. In other words, he could not have suffered and died, for suffering and death alike are impossible to God. Thus the Son of God became man and died for us on the cross in order to accomplish the work of our redemption. It was his humanity that fasted, prayed, suffered, and died for us, yet we are right in saying it was God who suffered, because his sufferings and works must be attributed to the person, and the person of Christ is God. There are two natures in Christ, the human and the divine, since he is both God and man. But there is only one person in Christ, a divine, not a human person, although he has a human nature. From this we must conclude that all the works of Christ are divine and infinite in value, because the more excellent the person, the more precious are his works. Hence the works of the divine person of Christ must be infinite in value. My dear Christian, be thankful to your divine Savior for the grace of redemption. Imagine that a man, influenced by love of you, would give up all his possessions. If he would even relinquish his very life, would you not be thankful to him and love him with all your heart? Behold, your divine Savior became a child of poverty, suffered the helplessness of infancy, the bitter and rude contumelies of an ungrateful world for thirty-three years, died on the cross in the most intense ignominy and pains for you. And should you render him no thanks? Should you be cold and indifferent towards him? Yea, even offend him anew by your sins? Oh, what a wretch you would be if you could treat your Redeemer in such a manner! Fall upon your knees, thank him with a grateful heart for the grace of redemption, and promise to love and serve him with fidelity all the days of your life. God the Son is our Redeemer. We may therefore with full confidence cry out to him, Have mercy on us. He was all love and mercy when he walked visibly on earth, suffered and died for us. And he is also all love and mercy now that he sits at the right hand of God. Love is stronger than death. Faith and hope may pass away, but love shall abide forever. Jesus Christ is our mediator with the Father. 
He continually shows him the marks of his wounds, pleading with him to deal with us, not according to his justice, but according to his mercy. Therefore, St. John writes, My little children, these things I write to you, that you may not sin. But if anyone sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the just. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for our sins only, but also for those of the whole world. But if you should be afraid, says St. Bernard, to seek help of Jesus Christ because of his divine majesty, he having remained God at the same time that he assumed human nature, seek a mediatrix with the mediator, have recourse to Mary, for she will intercede for you with her Son, who most certainly will hear her and obtain pardon for you from the Eternal Father. Should you sigh for the conversion of some erring soul, hasten to Mary. She will present your petition to Jesus, and he will grant it at her request. Among those who had been wounded in one of the battles of the late war and brought to a military hospital in the Mississippi Valley was a soldier whom all the surgeons declared could not live twenty-four hours. The poor man knew nothing of God and seemed to care but little for that eternity towards which he was fast hastening. The sisters vainly tried to produce some impression upon him. He did not respond to their earnest efforts, but they did not lose courage. So full of confidence were they in Mary. Too often had they beheld the wonderful effects of her intercession and the grace of her beloved Son to be thus easily repulsed, and as death drew near they redoubled their prayers. The more reluctant the sick man appeared to be to speak of the affairs of his soul, the more fervently did they pray to the Mother of Sorrows on his behalf. Contrary to all expectations, the man was still alive the next day, and to the surprise of all, remained in the same condition for more than two weeks. The surgeon, in his daily visits, expressed his astonishment to see him living, but the sisters felt assured that he must live until the waters of baptism should open for him the gates of heaven, and they redoubled their prayers to the refuge of sinners. While he still lingered, a great flood in our western rivers inundated all the lower floors of the hospital, and the patients who occupied them had to be hastily removed and sent to St. Louis, our soldier among the rest. As he was carried out, the doctors observed that it was most wonderful how he could live in that dreadful condition. A few hours after the boat had left the wharf, the soldier called to one of the sisters, several of whom accompanied the poor wounded men to the St. Louis Hospital. Sister, I'm dying, and I want you to baptize me. We may imagine her joy. He listened eagerly to what she told him was necessary to believe, and said that his determination not to listen to what the sisters wished to tell him arose from the fact that his father had made him promise when a boy never to become a Catholic and he feared to break his word. But now, he continued, I will do just what you tell me is right. We all know what must have been the sister's reply. She baptized him, and a few hours later, with the names of Jesus and Mary on his lips, he went to meet them in heaven. Rejoice, then, my dear Christian, that you are a child of Mary, and that she is your mother. What fear have you of being lost when you are under the protecting care of this powerful mother? Thus says St. Bonaventure, Everyone who loves this good mother and trusts in her protection should take courage and say, What do you fear, O my soul? The cause of your eternal salvation shall not be lost, as the final sentence depends upon Jesus, who is your brother, and upon Mary, who is your mother. But be not presumptuous. Think of your sins. Never cease to lament them and to do penance for them. Meditate frequently on the passion of Christ that you may never forget the immense ransom paid for your redemption. Finally, consider how many souls are now burning in hell for less heinous faults than those of which you are guilty. 
This consideration will inspire you with gratitude towards God, animate your fervor and penance, and preserve you from every relapse. Eighth Invocation God the Holy Ghost, have mercy on us. The Holy Ghost, whose mercy we implore, is the third person of the Blessed Trinity, true God, of the same power and majesty as the Father and Son. This, again, is an article of faith which is expressed in clear terms in the sacred scriptures. Thus St. Peter emphatically calls the Holy Ghost God when he says to Ananias, Why hath Satan tempted thy heart that thou should lie to the Holy Ghost? Thou hast not lied to men, but to God. The sacred scripture also attributes to the Holy Ghost divine perfections and works, such as eternity, omniscience, omnipotence, and the sanctification of men, from which it follows that he is God as well as the other two persons of the adorable Trinity. The Church, too, has taught this at all times, and therefore condemned as heretics the Macedonians who denied the divinity of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost, although God as the Father and the Son, is distinct in person from both. For he is not of himself as the Father, he is not begotten of the Father as the Son, but he proceeds from the Father and the Son. Tertullian very significantly says, The Holy Ghost proceeds from the Father and the Son as a ray from the Son. The Son remains in the ray and does not separate itself from its essence. Thus the Holy Ghost does not separate himself from God. He is God of God as light is produced from light. The Holy Ghost is usually represented in the form of a dove and in the shape of tongues of fire. In the form of a dove, because he descended upon Christ in this form when he was baptized by St. John in the river Jordan. In the shape of tongues of fire, because in this form he came down upon the apostles on Whit Sunday. The Holy Ghost as God, is omnipresent. As author and dispenser of graces, he abides especially in the Catholic Church and in the hearts of the just. What a great happiness you enjoy, my dear Christian, in belonging to the Catholic Church, wherein the Holy Ghost dwells and will dwell until the end of time. You are guarded against error, for what the Church teaches is the teaching of the Holy Ghost, who is divine truth. There you abundantly receive all that is necessary for your salvation. For in the church, the streams of grace continually flow to us from the Holy Ghost. Thank God daily for the inestimable grace of the true faith, and do not suffer yourself to be contaminated by the spirit of unbelief. Let your holy faith shine forth in all your works, honor it by a pious life, a life befitting a child of the Holy Church, and take to heart the words of our blessed Lord, Unto whomsoever much is given, of him much shall be required. The Holy Ghost is called holy, not as if he alone were holy, for holy, infinitely holy, are also the Father and the Son, but because his special work is the sanctification of mankind. The Holy Ghost sanctifies us, that is, he effects such changes within our souls that from sinners we are numbered with the just. From slaves of Satan we become children of God and heirs of heaven. Jesus Christ is the author of our sanctification, having merited for us the grace of sanctification by his death on the cross. But it is the Holy Ghost who really sanctifies us and applies to us the merits of Jesus Christ. If the Holy Ghost were not, the merits of Christ would profit us nothing. They would be an inaccessible treasure, not one part of which we could appropriate to ourselves. St. Chrysostom beautifully describes the grace of sanctification which the Holy Ghost produces in us. Through the Holy Ghost we obtain forgiveness of our sins. Through him we are cleansed from all imperfections. 
Through his gifts the men who suffer themselves to be guided become angels, not by their nature being changed, but what is still more wonderful, by remaining men, and at the same time living a life of purity and holiness like that of the angels. Recognize, my dear Christian, how much you owe to the Holy Ghost, and with the greatest solicitude endeavor to preserve the sanctifying grace which you received at your baptism, or recovered in the sacrament of penance after having lost it by sin. This grace is the greatest, the most to be desired of all treasures. As long as you possess it, you are the temple of the Holy Ghost, a child of God and an heir of heaven. But if you lose it, you become a slave of Satan, and hell opens to swallow you up forever in its terrible depths. Oh, what great evil, what ruin is incurred by the loss of sanctifying grace! Let your first and chief care then be to avoid sin above all things, and often say with the saints, Lord, let me die rather than sin grievously and lose the precious boon of thy sanctifying grace. But if you have the misfortune to lose this inestimable treasure, do not long remain in that miserable state. Make a good confession at your earliest opportunity in order to regain the grace you forfeited by sin. We may address this petition to the Holy Ghost with confidence, for why should he not have mercy on us, since he is the Spirit of love? We have, however, great reason to cry to him for mercy, because without his grace we can neither begin, nor prosecute, nor finish the important affair of our salvation. As the Apostle assures us, not that we are sufficient to think anything of ourselves as ourselves, but our sufficiency is from God. We cannot even conceive a good thought, much less avoid sin, overcome temptation, practice Christian virtues, or persevere in good to the end. All these things become possible to us by the grace and assistance of the Holy Ghost. Let us then daily pray to the Holy Ghost for strength and enlightenment to achieve the end for which we were created. But alas, we have often grieved this divine spirit by turning a deaf ear to his inspirations, by not making a good use of his graces, and even by abusing them for the commission of sin. Let us then have recourse to Mary, that she may intercede for us with the Holy Ghost. She, his most beloved and holy spouse, possesses his undivided love, and her request will never be passed unheeded or unheard. A certain man one day came to a missionary and asked him to hear his confession. To the question why he wished to go to confession, whether his desire was in consequence of a sermon which he'd heard or of a book which he'd read, the man replied that he had not heard a sermon for many years and had read nothing but romances and irreligious papers. The missionary said, Perhaps it is a devotion performed in honor of the Blessed Virgin which disposes you to seek forgiveness for your sins. The man replied, that his desire could not well proceed from such a cause, since he had only said one Hail Mary every day, and that mechanically. He then related how it happened, that he daily said a Hail Mary. I lost my mother on the day of my first communion, when I was only eleven years old. She called me to her bedside, took my little hands in hers, and with great tenderness and solicitude, depicted on her countenance, said, Henry, dear Henry, I do not wish you to become rich in the world, for riches profit nothing at the hour of death. My only desire is that you preserve your innocence and work out the salvation of your soul. Promise me, in the presence of this picture of the Blessed Virgin, pointing to a picture hanging on the wall, promise me to say a Hail Mary every evening in order to put yourself under the protection of Mary. Yes, dear mother, I said, I promise you that I will say the Hail Mary every day. Shortly after my mother breathed her last, but the promise made to her on her deathbed has been sacred to me, I have scrupulously kept it 
and for a long time it has been my only practice of religion, although mechanically performed. About a week ago, while searching for something in an old trunk, I found the picture of Mary, the witness of my promise. At that moment, the memory of my first communion, of my mother and her virtues, arose before my darkened soul, piercing its very depths as a flash of lightning illuminates the gloom of a starless night. Since that time, I've been in a constant state of uneasiness. I imagine I hear my mother say, Henry, do you not wish to be united with me in heaven? If so, you must do what is necessary. Go to confession. Do not delay. This, Father, is what has brought me to you. The missionary recognized in this narration the mercy of Mary, who through the intercession of the mother obtained the grace of conversion for this erring son. He exhorted him to reconcile himself to God and to enter upon the way of salvation. This he did. He made a sincere confession, dedicated himself to the Blessed Virgin, and persevered in virtue to the end. Behold, my dear Christian, a single Hail Mary, which this sinner said daily, procured for him the grace of conversion and salvation. Never let a day pass without venerating unceasingly Mary. Commend yourself to her protection. At the Angelus Domini especially, petition her to obtain for you the grace not to fall into sin, and beg her to intercede that you may preserve sanctifying grace until death. Holy Trinity, one God, have mercy on us. Having invoked each of the three divine persons separately, we address all three jointly and beg for mercy. When we say Holy Trinity, we confess our belief in the threefold personality of God, and by adding one God we express the unity of God. For there are three persons in God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Each of these three persons is really and truly God. The Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Ghost is God. They are not three gods, but three persons in one God, because all three persons have only one divine nature. Unity in Trinity. Trinity in Unity. How marvelous! Unity in Trinity, Trinity in Unity. Unity of nature in trinity of persons, trinity of persons in unity of nature. What admirable concord, what rapturous harmony. They are not three gods, because each of them has not a particular godhead, but each is, nevertheless, God, because each participates in the godhead common to all three persons, and possesses it perfectly whole and entire. The three divine persons differ from one another in their manner of being. Each one has his being in a different and to him peculiar manner. The Father is from eternity and of himself. The Son is not of himself, but proceeds from the Father, begotten of him from all eternity. In like manner, the Holy Ghost is not of himself, neither is he begotten, but from all eternity proceeds both from the Father and the Son. This great mystery of the Blessed Trinity was only obscurely indicated in the Old Testament. Jesus Christ first revealed it in clear and distinct terms when he said, Going, baptize all nations in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. He did not say, In the names, but in the name teaching thereby the unity of God, and by saying in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. He taught that they are three persons in one God, or one God in three divine persons, the Trinity. My dear Christian, you cannot comprehend the mystery of the Blessed Trinity, though you should possess the combined knowledge of all the most learned on earth, and understanding of the angels in heaven. For your faith you have a foundation as firm as a rock, the infallible word of God which the church announces to you. 
believe, pray, and often say, Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. Live in such a manner that you may hope hereafter to see the holy triune God, not as now, through a glass in an obscure manner, but face to face. Thus to see the ever and adorable Trinity will be to you an inexhaustible source of ineffable bliss. Although the mystery of the blessed Trinity is incomprehensible, the benefits which flow to us from it are manifest. God the Father is the creator of heaven and earth. Whatever lives, exists, and moves in this vast universe, he called into being out of nothing. He it is that preserves and governs the whole world, and without his will or permission, nothing whether great or insignificant can be done. He thinks of all. Not a sparrow falls from the roof without his knowledge and will. Even the hairs on our head are numbered. His solicitude extends to the little insect, whose shining wings glitter in the sunlight in the dust, as well as to the cherub that sits before his glorious throne. The eyes of all hope in him, and he gives them meat in due season. He opens his hand and fills with blessing every living creature. God the Son is our Redeemer. In his infinite love he came from heaven upon earth and became man in order to accomplish the work of our redemption. And how has he accomplished this work? He became a poor, weak, helpless child, lived in poverty and lowliness on earth for thirty-three years, endured persecutions and sufferings of every description, and finally died in the most intense ignominy and pain on the cross. Thus the Son of God redeemed us from sin and eternal damnation, reconciled us with God the Father, and again opened for us the portals of heaven. The Holy Ghost is our sanctifier. Jesus Christ, having accomplished the work of our redemption, the Holy Ghost incessantly labors to apply to us the fruits of redemption and to effect our sanctification. He enlightens us that we may know what is good and true. He gives us the will and the strength to walk in the way of God's commandments. He cleanses us from the stains of sin and infuses into our hearts the love of God. Yea, he dwells in us himself and bestows upon us graces innumerable that we may fight the good fight and obtain the crown of glory. The Holy Ghost is like a mother who loves her child most tenderly, watches over it as the apple of her eye, and with the greatest solicitude supplies all its wants. Consider these benefits of the Blessed Trinity and reciprocate them with the gratitude befitting their value. Be a good, obedient child of your Father in heaven, Place entire confidence in him and love with him with your whole heart. Walk in the footsteps of your Redeemer. Deny yourself, mortify your passions, and live according to the principles of the gospel. Be docile, cheerfully follow the inspirations of the Holy Ghost, and preserve a pure heart that he may always dwell in you. We may address this petition for mercy to the Blessed Trinity with the greatest confidence, for we are the children of the Father, who loves us most tenderly, brothers and sisters of the Son, who for love of us became man, suffered and died, temples of the Holy Ghost, who dwells within our souls. But alas, we have often and grievously sinned against the Blessed Trinity, against the Father by our sins of ignorance, against the Son by our sins of weakness, and against the Holy Ghost by our sins of malice. We have every reason, therefore, to fear that the Blessed Trinity may reject us and not have mercy on us. But there is one, there is one in whom the Blessed Trinity is well pleased, Mary, the Holy Virgin, for she is the dearly beloved daughter of the Father, the chosen mother of the Son, and the Immaculate Spouse of the Holy Ghost. 
She, therefore, can obtain from the Blessed Trinity whatever she may ask in our behalf. The following remarkable occurrence took place in Rome during the pontificate of Pope Gregory, the great pontiff and glorious saint. The pestilence broke out. Every day the disease carried off a vast number of persons of both sexes and of all ages and conditions. In vain had the Holy Father preached penance, ordered fasting, and enjoined public prayers. At length he had recourse entirely to Mary, whose image, painted by St. Luke, he was inspired to carry in procession through the streets of Rome. O oh, prodigy! Scarcely had the august likeness of Christ's dear mother been brought forth from its sanctuary than the plague suddenly ceased its ravages, so suddenly as to leave no doubt of such a miracle. At the same moment there was seen over Adrian's terrace, since called the castle of San Angelo, an angel in human form, sheathing a bloody sword, and celestial spirits were heard singing that hymn of joyful gratitude in honor of Mary, Regine Celi Laetari Alleluia, to which the sovereign pontiff and the entire procession added in strains of joy, Ora pro nobis Deum Alleluia. The Church subsequently adopted that hymn to salute the Queen of Heaven during the Paschal season, which is the time of our beloved Mother's joys. My dear Christian, in this example you again perceive the power of Mary's intercession. We see how a terrible pestilence, which spared neither age nor youth, and fastened its fell grasp on the wealthy alike as upon those suffering from poverty and want, was arrested by prayers and supplications to her. Equally efficacious, nay more so, is her intercession with Jesus for the poor sinner stricken down with the epidemic of sin. You have sinned, whether grievously or not, is best known to your own soul. Ask her to aid you in your efforts to lead a holy life. Tenth Invocation Holy Mary, pray for us. Having invoked the Blessed Trinity for mercy, we justly address ourselves to Mary and implore her intercession, for she is most intimately connected with the Holy Trinity. She is the chosen daughter of the Father, the Virgin Mother of the Son, and the Immaculate Spouse of the Holy Ghost. We call her Mary. What a sweet, lovely name! A name so lovely that the angels rejoice as often as they hear it, so sweet that devout Christians never weary of pronouncing it, a name that gives joy to those in health, consolation to the sick, comfort to the depressed, courage and strength to the tempted, and peace to the dying. O element, O pious, O sweet Virgin Mary, exclaimed St. Bernard, thy name is so sweet, so lovely, that I can scarcely mention it without being inflamed with love for thee and for God who has given it to thee. The blessed Henry Suso assures us that when he pronounces the name of Mary, his confidence is unutterably augmented and his heart inflamed with love. He says that this dear name, like honey, seems to penetrate into the inmost depths of his soul, and enraptured he exclaims, O sweet name, O Mary, what must thou be thyself when even thy name is so sweet and lovely? My dear Christian, after the holy name of Jesus, no name should be so dear to you as the name of Mary. Bear it always lovingly within your heart, and often pronounce it, but always with veneration and devotion. Begin and conclude your day's work by the invocation of this holy name. Whilst employed at your usual avocations, during a journey, on awakening at night, and in time of temptation, say a Hail Mary. The name Mary is very significant. It means Lady Mistress. Both these terms belong justly to Mary, for as Mother of God she possesses, after God, 
the highest power and authority in heaven and on earth. Mary is justly called Lady, for she is the mother of the Lord. The ruler of the whole world freed her, not only from all subjection, but also exalted her above every creature. All Orthodox Christians venerate her as Lady, and millions of devout souls daily call upon her as Our Dear Lady. The princes and rulers of the earth pay homage to her as Lady and Mistress, and place whole nations and dominions under her protection. Even the blessed spirits in heaven salute her as such, and show her the greatest veneration. Mary is called the Star of the Sea. This name is very appropriate for the Blessed Virgin, for as the star, without detriment to its essence, produces light, so the purest of virgins brought forth her son without violating her virginity. The ray that comes forth from the star does not diminish its luster, and the son who was born of this mother did not diminish her purity. She is the bright star of Jacob, whose rays enlighten the whole world, whose splendor shines conspicuously in heaven and penetrates hell. It pervades the earth and warms not the body but the soul, banishing vice and maturing virtue. For she is that bright and splendid star, elevated above this vast and spacious sea. She glitters by her merits and enlightens by her example. St. Bernard Finally, the signification of Mary is sea, and especially a sea of bitterness. Her whole life upon the earth was a sea of bitterness. Consider the greatness of her grief at the prophecy of Simeon in the temple, at the flight into Egypt, at the loss of her son, at the sight of the Savior bound, abused, and maltreated, at his condemnation to death, and above all, contemplate her intense sorrow when she stood beneath the cross at his crucifixion. What must her maternal heart have suffered when she heard how her dearest son cried out on the cross, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When she saw how he bowed his head and died. What an inexpressible sadness must have filled her soul when the lifeless body of her son was laid in her bosom. Truly, streams of bitterness flowed into her heart, a sword of grief pierced her soul, and she was plunged into a sea of sufferings. Hence, St. Idolphonsus does not hesitate to assert that the sorrows of Mary surpassed all the sorrows of men, and St. Anselm adds that the most cruel tortures inflicted upon the martyrs are nothing compared with the martyrdom of Mary. My dear Christian, Acknowledge Mary as your mistress and choose her for your model. If you are her faithful servant, she will be a good mother to you and protect you in life and in death. As the mariner looks up to the star of the sea, do you look up to Mary. She will guide you to the port of a blessed eternity. Frequently meditate on her virtues. You will merit her love and protection in a high degree if you endeavor to imitate her virtues, especially her humility and chastity, meekness and patience, and to practice them from one confession to another. Mary was the mother of God, and purer than the angels of heaven. Yet, during her life, she was plunged into a sea of bitterness and sorrow. How can you complain of sufferings, sinful creature, that you are? Be patient in sufferings and afflictions, be resigned to the will of God, and esteem yourself happy, if you have to suffer much, for from the thorns will ripen sweet fruits for eternal life. The name of Mary possesses a wonderful power. After the name of Jesus there is no other name so powerful to help us and to procure for us so many graces as the name of Mary. The devils stand in such great fear of Mary, the Queen of Heaven, that as soon as they hear her name pronounced, they flee as from a devouring fire. Thomas a Kempis. The following history is an evidence of the power of this name. In the year 1683, the Turks laid siege to the city of Vienna. 
Their army was so numerous, and every circumstance tended to favor it to such a degree, that all hope for the unfortunate city seemed lost. Wherefore, the emperor, Leopold I, fled. In this dire necessity all the inhabitants had recourse to Mary, and invoked her name with great confidence and enthusiasm. On the day of her nativity they prayed with redoubled fervor, and behold, their prayer was heard, for suddenly waving standards were seen on the summits of the distant hills. It was Sobieski, the king of Poland, leading on his army, which indeed was small, but the piety of the general and of the soldiers had merited the protection of the Most High. On September 12th, Sobieski heard Mass, at which he himself served, kneeling with his arms extended in the form of a cross all the time, except when it was necessary to employ them in ministering to the priest. He received Holy Communion, and after Mass, the blessing which the priest gave to him and to the whole army. Then, rising from his knees, he said aloud, Let us now march against the enemy with full confidence in the protection of heaven and under the certain patronage of the Blessed Virgin. They were soon in sight of the camp of the infidels, before whose countless host and thundering cannon the Poles involuntarily shrank and acknowledged that they could hope for victory only from heaven. The battle began, but the assault of the Christians upon the Turks was so terrible that the Khan of the Tartars in great fear took to flight. Courage forsook the Grand Vizier Mustafa, and he had no strength left but to fly. With him the whole Turkish army fled in the utmost disorder from a defeat so terrible that the battlefield was strewn with the dead and dying. Most of those who sought safety in flight found their death in the waters of the Danube. The conquerors obtained immense riches. Sobieski, after his victory, upon his entrance into Vienna, immediately presented himself before the altar to return thanks to God, and joined in the Te Deum, which was intoned with his countenance fixed upon the ground, and with the most lively expressions of humility, gratitude, and devotion. In the streets, while the people were busy proclaiming his praises, and looking upon him with astonishment, the king attributed the whole success of his armies to God. In order to institute a perpetual memorial of gratitude for this benefit, Innocents the Eleventh ordained that the festival of the holy name of Mary should be annually celebrated throughout the Christian world on the first Sunday after her nativity. Since that time, the Church celebrates the festival of the name of Mary. My dear Christian, have great confidence in Mary in all your necessities, and do as St. Bernard admonishes you in these eloquent words. If you find yourself tossed about by storms and tempests in the current of this world, turn not away your eyes from the brightness of this star, unless you wish to be overwhelmed by the waves. If the winds of temptation arise, if you strike on a rock of tribulation, look up to this star, call on Mary. If you are tossed about by the swellings of pride or ambition, of envy or detraction, look up to this star, call on Mary. If anger or avarice or concupiscence agitate your mind, turn to Mary. When affrighted at the enormity of your crimes, confounded at the defilements of your conscience, or terrified with the dread of the future judgment, you feel yourself about to be involved in the whirlpool of despondency or engulfed in the abyss of despair, think on Mary. In dangers, in difficulties and doubts, think on Mary and invoke her. Let her name never depart from your lips or heart, and that you may obtain the benefit of her intercession, forget not to imitate the example of her life. In following her you cannot go astray. In appealing to her you cannot despair, and in thinking upon her you can never err. While she supports you, you cannot fall. While she protects you, you cannot fear. While she guides you, you cannot feel fatigue. 
and if she be propitious, you will safely reach the eternal shore. Eleventh Invocation Holy Mother of God, pray for us. Mary is the Mother of God because she is the Mother of Jesus Christ. She is not indeed the Mother of the Divine Nature, which has existed from all eternity, and could not have had a beginning, as it cannot have an end. Since Christ is the true Son of God, and Mary brought him forth after he had assumed human nature in her, the title, Mother of God, is justly due to her. Hence, St. Cyril says, If our Lord Jesus Christ is God, must not the Holy Virgin, who brought forth the Son of God, be the Mother of God? The archangel Gabriel also attributed to her the dignity of Mother of God when he said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. And therefore the Holy, which shall be born of thee, shall be called the Son of God. According to these words, he whom Mary was to conceive of the Holy Ghost and bring forth is the Son of God. Therefore, she must be the mother of God, for she calls Christ her son. If Christ the Son of God is her son, what else can she be but the mother of God? St. Elizabeth, when visited by Mary, who had conceived the Son of God, exclaimed, Whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? And the Christians of all times have honored and venerated her as the mother of our Lord, as the mother of God. When the wicked Nestorius, patriarch of Constantinople, ventured the erroneous assertion that Mary should not be styled the mother of God, but of the man who was Christ, thus denying the incarnation of the Son of God, and thus also rendering void his death on the cross, since it is only the union of the two natures of God and man in Jesus Christ that imparts an infinite value to the sufferings endured by him in his human nature, a sentiment of intense horror pervaded the faithful at this innovation. The church condemned the error in the general council of Ephesus in the year 431, which asserted the glorious privilege of Mary by declaring her to be the mother of God. My dear Christian, thank God that in Mary you can venerate the mother of God, for if she were not the mother of God, Jesus Christ, whom she conceived and brought forth, would not be the Son of God, therefore not true God. And if he were not God, his doctrine being that of a mere man would not deserve our firm, unconditional belief. His miracles would be illusions, our redemption vain, and consequently the whole groundwork of Christianity would be taken away. It is of the utmost importance, therefore, that you recognize, honor, and venerate Mary as the Mother of God. As Mother of God, Mary possesses an incomprehensible dignity. In order to understand how exalted is this dignity, we should be able to comprehend the greatness and sublimity of God himself. With the exception of God, whatever is great and venerable in heaven and on earth appears as nothing when compared to the dignity of the Mother of God. Mary is the mother of God, therefore infinitely higher in dignity than all the queens of the earth, for these give birth only to temporal kings. But Mary has brought forth the king of heaven and earth. Mary is the mother of God, therefore higher in dignity than all the saints, for these, although crowned with honor and glory, are only servants of God, while she is his mother. Nay, Mary surpasses in dignity even the highest order of angels, the cherubim and seraphim. For though they stand nearest to the throne of God, yet none can say with Mary to Jesus, Thou art my son. St. Thomas of Aquinas says, By becoming the mother of God, Mary received an almost infinite dignity on account of her intimate connection with the infinite good. Who can comprehend the dignity of Mary, who has brought forth him at whose name every knee shall bend? Of those that are in heaven, upon earth, and under the earth, 
him who sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, him who shall one day come with great power and majesty to judge the living and the dead. Truly St. Bonaventure was justified in saying, Mary, by becoming the mother of God, has obtained an infinite dignity. God could have created a greater world than the one we inhabit. He could have created a greater heaven than the one above us. But he could not create a greater mother than the mother of God. Mary, conscious of her exalted dignity, exclaims with enthusiasm, From henceforth all generations shall call me blessed, for he that is mighty hath done great things to me. My dear Christian, admire the exalted dignity of the mother of God, and show a greater veneration for her than for all the angels and saints. Consider, however, that it was her profound humility which, in a special manner, rendered her the object of God's complacency. She was the most humble of all her sex, therefore God was pleased with her and chose her to be the mother of his son. St. Bernard says, Without humility I am certain that even the virginity of Mary would not have been acceptable to God, for although her virginal purity was most pleasing to him, still it was her humility that merited for her the great privilege of becoming the mother of God. Be you also humble. Banish all pride and vanity from your heart. Do not arrogate to yourself glory in anything whatsoever, but give it all to God. Despise no one but yourself. Do not prefer yourself before others. Patiently bear humiliations, and be not incensed against him who attempts to vilify your reputation. If you are truly humble of heart, you will be the object of God's complacency, and he will exalt you in heaven. Because Mary is the mother of God, we can cry to her with full confidence, Pray for us. Who could believe that Jesus would refuse his mother any request? When he inclines his ear to the intercessions of the saints, who are only his servants, how can he refuse to hear his mother, whom he loves most tenderly? No, the son rejoices when the mother asks him for anything, for he wishes that whatever he gives us, he can give us for his mother's sake, in order thus to reward the benefits which he has received from her, since it is to her he owes his humanity. A youth who had committed many sins against holy purity was addicted to many evil habits, went to confession to Father Nicholas Zucchi in Rome. The good priest received him kindly, had great compassion on him in his miserable state, and told him that devotion to the Blessed Virgin alone could free him from the detestable habitual vice of impurity. He then gave him as a penance until his next confession to say one Hail Mary every morning and evening, to offer up to her his eyes, his hands, his heart, and his whole body, and to beg her to take them into her keeping as her special property, and then three times to kiss the floor. The youth faithfully performed this penance, still no great amendment was perceptible. His confessor, however, recommended him never to omit this prayer, and encouraged him to have every confidence in the powerful protection of Mary. The youth, shortly afterwards with some of his companions, left Rome and traveled abroad for several years. On his return he again called upon his former confessor, whose joy and admiration were great at finding him entirely changed and perfectly free from his former vices. Tell me, my dear child, his confessor asked, how have you caused this happy change of life? The youth replied, the Blessed Virgin Mary obtained this great grace for me on account of the little devotion you taught me. But that was not all. When the worthy priest related the fact in the pulpit, a captain who for many years had led a life of sinful intimacy with a wicked woman was present. He resolved to perform this devotion in order to break the chains of sin, 
and the result was that he really and effectually renounced his evil habit and changed his life. Behold, such grace as God bestows upon us through the intercession of his mother. Therefore, have confidence in her, and never fail to invoke her intercession in all your necessities. If you are addicted to an habitual sin, which occasions you many temptations and causes you to fall again and again, adopt the practice of this young man. Say a Hail Mary every morning and evening in honor of the Mother of God. Dedicate yourself to her as her property, and then, humbling yourself, kiss the floor. You may hope with confidence, if you only have the earnest and sincere will to amend, that Mary will help you, and that you will soon be released from the galling chains of your sinful habit. Twelfth Invocation Holy Virgin of Virgins, Pray for us. We call Mary the Virgin of Virgins because she stands at the head of the interminable train of Christian virgins. She is, says St. Ambrose, the first who planted the standard of holy virginity. Among the Jews, virginity was not esteemed. Far more respected were mothers who were blessed with many children. Hence the daughters of the Jews, as soon as they attained the age of maidenhood, rushed into the matrimonial state, not indeed so much from a motive of sensual gratification as for the honor of maternity, because the Jews were an earthly-minded people with but little inclination for things of a higher order. God had neither commanded nor advised the virginal life, nor promised a special reward for this practice. In vain, therefore, we seek an example in the old law of one who had lived a life of virginal purity from religious motives. Mary alone is an exception. She is the first and only one of the Jewish people who resolved to live and die a spotless virgin. And as many fathers of the church teach, she confirmed this resolution by a vow. True, she was afterwards espoused to Joseph, but as St. Augustine remarks, she took this step not of herself, but by the inspiration of God, who gave her the express assurance that Joseph would not only respect her virginity, but also defend her against all violence. That she most firmly resolved to preserve her virginal purity, even after her espousal to St. Joseph, we see clearly from the Gospel. The angel said to her, Behold, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and shalt bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. Astonished beyond measure, she asked, How shall this be done, because I know not man? She demands an explanation, for she knows not what manner of speech this might be. Overwhelmed with fear, she timidly asks, How can this be, for I know not man? How can I become a mother? without sacrificing the purity which I have vowed to God. The angel explains that this great mystery shall be accomplished, and yet her virginal purity remain immaculate. The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the Most High shall overshadow thee. Therefore the Holy One born of thee shall be called the Son of God. It is only after being thus reassured that Mary bows her head to the will of God, and utters these remarkable words, which indicate her character. Behold the handmaid of the Lord, be it done to me according to thy word. This noble example of the Blessed Virgin has been at all times a powerful incentive for many Christians to make the resolution to serve God in undefiled purity. Virginity was highly esteemed, was admired, loved, cherished, and fostered in the palaces of princes and in the cabins of the poor. Youths and maidens of every condition of life left the world, made the religious vows, and frequently even married people renounced their marriage rights and lived together as brother and sister. History also mentions the names of many virgins who turned away from the most brilliant alliances and preferred rather to die than to enter the married state. My dear Christian, 
honor and love virginal purity, for there is no virtue more beautiful or more lovely. Virginity, says St. Chrysostom, is more brilliant than the rays of the sun. It draws us from all things earthly and renders us capable of beholding the Son of Justice with undimmed eyes. Blessed are you if you feel within yourself the vocation to a virginal life, but thrice blessed if you comply with your vocation and in continual continency imitate Jesus and Mary. Preserve at least the chastity of your state of life most carefully, for without such an observance you cannot even be saved. Mary is called Virgin of Virgins because she was the purest of all virgins. What the sun is to the stars, Mary is when compared with other virgins. The purity of all the virgins in the court of heaven pales before the splendor of her immaculate whiteness. She is, therefore, designated in the canticles as a lily, whilst the other virgins are compared to thorns. As a lily among thorns, so is my love among the daughters. All virgins, no matter how chastely they may live, are nevertheless thorns to themselves and to others. They are thorns to themselves, for their flesh rebels against the Spirit and causes them many temptations, which they must continually combat and overcome, that their purity may not suffer shipwreck. They are thorns to others, for however plainly they may dress, however modestly they may conduct themselves in their intercourse with the world, However retired may be the life they lead, they are frequently against their will the occasion of temptation to others by their appearance. It was not thus with Mary, the lily among thorns. She herself never during her whole life had the least temptation against purity. For the stain of original sin not adhering to her, she was free from all evil concupiscence. An unchaste thought, or an impure desire, never arose in her heart. She was an angel in human flesh. In like manner she caused others no temptations. Her appearance, on the contrary, infused into all pure thoughts and feelings. Hence St. Thomas of Aquin says, The beauty of the Blessed Virgin awakened in all who saw her a love for chastity. St. Jerome says that it is probable St. Joseph owed the preservation of his virginal purity to his conversation with Mary. Hence he writes to Helvidius, who denied the virginity of Mary, You say that Mary did not remain a virgin, and I assert still more, and say that Joseph preserved his virginal purity through her. Yes, wherever the name of Mary has been made known by the ministers of the gospel, Innumerable virgins in every age and in every clime of all ranks and conditions of life have consecrated to God the purest affections of their hearts and have found in the relinquishment of all earthly pleasures and in the entire and undivided dedication of their whole being to God a purer, more tranquil, and more enduring happiness than falls to the lot of less heroic souls.